Um, Daniel, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this tonight and uh, thank you again for that uh, interview we did actually about five years ago now. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me and it's a real honour to be able to, uh, yeah. it's a real honour to be able to take part in this uh, really interesting exhibition. Thank you. Um, we, we obviously did quite an uh, extensive interview um, last time and that's now on YouTube. Uh, if you look for Lear and Rental interviews on YouTube, you can find that. So we'll try not to repeat things, so you don't have to answer the same questions over and over again. We'll try and pick a, a couple of new things to, to, to different angles to talk about them. And one which uh, very, very, very grateful to you to uh, lending us your um, Korg synth, uh, which is on display at the back there. Um, understand that's never been in, in public display before so I really appreciate that. Um, obviously that was the that was the synth on which you wrote Warm Weatherette and TVOD. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that instrument and what it meant, means to you and, and what you used it for? I mean it was, it was, a, it was a specific moment really. There was punk going on. Before that, synthesizers were really uh, unreachable for most people uh, because they were just so expensive, like a Moog or an Arp, something like that. Yeah. And then the Japanese imports started coming in, Roland and Korg. And then it got to the next level when those were being sold second hand. And uh, that's when I decided that I, I wanted to extend my love of electronic music into actually trying to make it. And um, I bought a tape recorder. And I just started messing around really, and uh, I just had the, that synthesizer. And when I decided to make the single, that's, that's I, I, it was a four-track tape recorder which I had, TIA, and I that's why I'd, I used the, the chord for all the sounds on the, on that record. So all the percussion sounds, and what Chris was kind of talking about earlier, you know, everything was hand played, no sequences or anything yeah. like that. So um, and it still works, which is amazing, and uh, I still love the sound. I don't use it that much, but when I turn it on, I start playing it. It's, 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 there's something magical about it that doesn't sound like any other synthesizer. Yeah. Some really weird things on it. It's kind of it was designed to be like on top of a you know a Hammond organ or something. They have to play like oh, okay. a lead line. That, I mean that was where it was. I think that's where it was what it was designed for. But um, and the same as with Robert and, uh, and Thomas, we had very limited equipment, and we pushed it much further than it was ever intended to go. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so. yeah. And it, it's lovely to see it uh, reunited with with uh, Robert's uh, effects unit there, which were yeah. were both on the tour. The yeah. tour we heard about uh, in nineteen seventy nine, and and the wasp, although that isn't the original yeah. wasp, which uh, Robert's wasp we now understand is in Japan. Um, it was pretty much destroyed by White House, I think. But yeah. um, it's in a it's yeah. in a collector's. Uh, <laughs> in Japan yeah. um, and as I was saying to you, the, the wasp there um, was loaned to us uh, by someone who was in a band called Sudetan Kresh um, and they did a, a record with Yazoo so there's, there's a slight connection to you but yeah. with that as well um, so it, it's lovely to see these, um, these instruments out and display and, and it's lovely to hear that it still works because yeah, that sounds great <laughs> Um, moving on to um, the Double Heart single on, on Mute, um, that was the 10th single, I think, on, yeah. on Mute at the time. Um, in retrospect, um, do you have any anecdotes about that single and its recording? And I think Daff were involved in some way as well. Yeah, um, you know, I was trying to, you know, Robert was was kind of a reluctant, you know, it was, a, it was sometimes quite reluctant about recording and things. And if he did, and if he did record them, then he would he'd never be quite really happy with it. It was very self-critical. So I thought, and we were still in touch after, you know, working together live and so forth. And I thought it would be really good to get him into a studio and sort of get him to finish something. And um, he was looking for a drummer. And um, I suggested Robert Girl from DAF, who we'd already started, we were already releasing their records. And um, 
I don't really have that many anecdotes, unfortunately. <laughs> so, I mean, that's okay. But it, was, but it was recorded at Blackwing Studios, yeah. which um, in in uh, in Southwark, which is a studio that became like a real home for Mute at the time. We were very anti-recording studios because okay. recording studios were like that was like part of the rock and roll industry thing that we were all against. But um, I had to do something in a studio that was beyond what I could do at home. And I searched around Melody Maker or wherever for the studios and I phoned up a lot and I didn't really like, it didn't sound very good. I said, I'm not coming with a band, I'm just coming with a synthesizer. And it's kind of, people go, what are you talking about? And um, I f finally got to Blackwing, and, uh, which was owned by an interesting character called Eric Radcliffe. He was a, he was a guitarist and he was, um, he was a scientist as well. And actually he was at Imperial College with Brian May and the Queen guys. Okay. Um, and I said, oh yeah, we're just going to come in and say, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, so, and, and he was brilliant to work with. And uh, we did a lot there, Fat Gadget albums, Silicon Teens, um, uh, Duet MO, Dome also used it, Graham and Bruce, they used it. Um, Ivo at 4AD used it a lot as well at that point. I think Pump Up the Volume was done there. Okay. And, this mortal coil, so it became like a hub. Yeah, it was the only studio that we all felt comfortable with in that because the guy who was running it was so sympathetic to what we were doing. You know? yeah. It wasn't like it was this kind of cliche of like recordings, produ uh, record producers with cowboy boots with their <laughs> feet on the desk, you know, <laughs> yawning and, uh, and lots of hessian. <laughs> <laughs> and by this point, what, was there some connection or essence? That connected the, the artists you were working with that time, you know, DAF, Had Gadget, Non, Robert. Was there something that connected them, or was it was it just your personal? Well, yeah, I mean, interest? I mean, there was a lot that connected them in a way. They were all coming. We were they. We were all coming from a place of um, otherness, being you know outsiders, uh, musical outsiders, and in some ways people outsiders, you know, and um, I mean DAF, I was I was a big fan in the 70s of you know, crap, what's known as crowd rock, yeah. kind of racist term, but, but still. And, um, they kind of reclaimed it for themselves. Yeah, they did reclaim it, yeah. But when, <laughs> when punk started, I thought this is going to be, I wonder what's going to happen in Germany, mm. because the, the whole angle is so different, you know, they might take a bit of a culture and then sort of twist it in a completely different way, and then I, I met DAF. And I think it was an attitude, really, you know. I mean, of course there was aesthetic links as well. We were all basically working with unconventional instruments, you know, there was Boyd with his... Oh, with, yes. With his... Guitar with an air fan? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and cassette with, you know, switches and things like that. I met Boyd very early on, actually, in, in, in the whole process. I met him at Rough Trade Shop. I met everybody at Rough Trade Shop at that point, because that was very, like, a cultural yeah. centre, you know. And... Um, so yeah, we were all experimenting. We were all, we were all. I think you know, we were all kind of inspired by punk. We, um, but I think it was more about the spirit than the music in the yeah. end. I mean, the music was amazing at the beginning, the energy. But then it, the energy just kind of got into its own loop and didn't go forward. And I think we liked that kind of aspect of simplicity or minimal, kind of minimal approach to making music. And but we was kind of but the music wasn't the music didn't catch up with the attitude, yeah. and so I think so it was the next step, and it wasn't just us; it was loads of people. That so you know, so you know, I think yeah. So the punk spirit was very, very in inspiring to all of us, you know, and this kind of feeling of experimentation and kind of throwing things at the wall and seeing what stuck, and you know, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> something um, like that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you've, you've said before that Mute, um, as a label, kind of happened by accident rather than design. But did it did it feel more like a label at this point? Oh yeah, I mean, I think yeah. When I say that, what I mean is, I never when I put out my first single, I never uh, it was never an ambition to start a record label. I just wanted to, to do that. But then, yeah. and then I sort of get demo tapes and. It was very strange. I didn't know why people sent me demo tapes. I was not a record label. Yeah. I just bought a record. Then I met, I met uh, Frank Tovey, Fat Gadget, um, introduced to me by Edwin Pouncey, 
-hmm. who was the enemy savage pencil cartoonist. And I really, you know, we just got on and I liked his aesthetic. I thought he had a really dark, he, we shared a kind of similar dark sense of humour. Yeah. And I said, why don't we make a record? And at that point, that's when it started, that's when it became a label, really. Yeah. You've, you've worked with hundreds, thousands of artists, but... Thousands? Yeah. Oh, thousands. <laughs> 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 connected with, anyway. Yeah. Uh, Rob obviously has, a, you know, there's a clear affinity with, with Robert, uh, who's going back, mm -hmm. uh, all the way back, but obviously continued <coughs> long after um, we actually recorded together. Um, you know, was, was that a personal thing? Was that a musical connection? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, was, it was both of those things. I mean, we, you know, as I think it was mentioned in the film, we met at a Throbbing Gristle yeah. gig, you know. And um, we both, after the show, we went, uh, we both went down to the front to sort of just like engage with the band, with Throbbing Gristle. And we saw it, and they were very friendly. I remember Sleazy showing us something. I said, oh, I said, oh, well, how'd you get that? What sort of promising? Or just some nerdy question. Yeah. And he was super friendly and um, not like the stage persona at all. They were really warm mm. and friendly and encouraging. And then Robert and I, we just started talking. And I think I heard his single then, or he told me about his single. Our singles had just come out at yeah. that point. And um, we came from very different backgrounds. I think that was quite interesting. You know, I'm a middle class North London person. Uh, then he was from, you know, the Port of Glasgow, very different background. Probably the poorest part of the Port of Glasgow. Yeah, I've never actually been there. Uh, but and I think that was interesting. I mean, I don't think it's not something that we spoke about, mm -hmm. but I think, I think that difference of kind of background was kind of um, possibly part of why we got on so well. You know, we weren't, it wasn't like we were, there wasn't somebody else from North London I was competing with. There was, well, you know, so I don't know. I don't know yeah. why, but it just, but we just really got on. Yeah, we had a very similar aesthetic. I think we got on, and you know, it did end. It did end in a drunken brawl. Well, didn't end. No, it didn't end. But uh, we're friends. Yeah. Really, until, I think. Until I think. I, yeah. But I think you know, uh, we 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 did the rough trade tour, and I think we thought that was probably enough now. You know? Yeah. Because we wanted to keep moving forward. You know. It was, you know. We didn't yeah. really want to be a band. We just yeah. just were brought together by circumstances. That seems to be a common theme with both Thomas and Robert, um, and and you touched on it in the film that you said we we were a bit older, but yeah. in, in terms of a lot of the punks were 18, 17, and yeah. you were twenty five, and so were yeah. Thomas and Robert. Um, they were quite sing, sing, um, single minded and where they wanted to go extremely, yeah, um, and they weren't really prepared to compromise, and, and you know they, they turned down a number of. Quite lucrative type of offers. You, you mm. mentioned the uh, the wire, the wires management offered to take them on. And yeah, we were courted. We were courted by. We met wire. Uh, we met uh, Mike Collins, who was one half of the management company. When we the first after the after the um, cryptic club, mm. we were invited by Prague Vec, uh, kind of post punk band around the time. They did who I knew a bit. They had a little three gig tour, and they invited us to. Uh, to join them, to support them. It was actually interesting. I mean, we played at the factory in Manchester, which was before the Hacienda. It's called yeah. the Russell Club, but yeah, the middle of Hume. Yeah. Sorry, middle in the middle of Hume. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was pretty. And nice. um, and that's where I first met Tony Wilson, and he was getting very excited because he showed me the sleeve for the first EP, mm. the factory EP. So it was really early days, and then Mike Collins. Uh, Started talking to us. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm you know I manage Wire, and they're real fans of your music. And we went, and then we got back to London. They invite we went around and met up with Wire in a pub somewhere, and that was the beginning of a very long relationship, you know. And the Mike and uh, Brian Grant, who was his partner, who'd been the Pink Floyd's tour manager, and uh, ran Britannia Row. They wanted they they kind of were interested in managing us, and we were they were they were good guys. But we didn't really want to be a band to be managed. We didn't, you know, yeah. First of all, we do it for a manager. Second of all, we didn't want to be a band. So that kind of. But I'm still, you know, close to all those guys. Yeah. yeah. And I think a similar thing happened after the bridge, but with Thomas and Robert, they didn't want to be a band either. And um, Eno's label, uh, E.G., were 
keen on license and real work. And, oh, really? And they were like, no, we're not a unit. You know, we, yeah. we don't want. <laughs> so, in, in, a, in a way, do you think some of these decisions kind of had an impact on their musical careers and so on? Yeah, no, I, yes. Well, I'm sure, you know, who knows? But I mean, I think they're what I would call obstinacy. Because they were pretty obstinate guys. Um, <laughs> Thomas still is. <laughs> was part of what they were musically. Mm. You know, so if they hadn't had that, they, they wouldn't be making the music they, yeah. that they, they made in the first place. So, you know, who knows? Yes, uh, you know. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously tonight we're, um, we're celebrating the, the reissue of the bridge. Mm -hmm. um, you weren't directly involved in, in the recording of that and so on, but you, you would have heard it early on, I would imagine, and your thoughts of, at the time and, and maybe now, are, are they different or...? Well, I mean, I was, I was, uh, I don't, yeah, I heard it, yeah, super early on. I can't remember if I heard it before it was released or on release, but it was a remarkable record, I thought. And, and knowing the kind of technology they were using, I, I thought that was the best use of that I'd ever heard, the most extensive use I'd ever heard. And musically, and musically really strong, it wasn't just, just for the sake of it, you know, it wasn't technology for the sake of it, the music was really, really strong. Yeah. Um, loved the sleeve. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and I, you know, as Chris said in the film, you can't put it, you can't place it in time, it's, it's, it's in another universe, another time, in another time warp. Yeah. And I still think the same today. Yeah. I'm really happy to be releasing it, that, that um, we're able to release it, because it's yeah. an important record. Yeah. And uh, it's a very important record, isn't it? And as you said in your opening, uh, in your opening speech, you know, they, they are under-recognised, I think, yeah. um, for what they did. And um, as, you know, partly because of their own single-mindedness, which is what made them what they were, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can't separate the no, character from the no. music. Yeah. Um, so looking back to going back a bit to '78, your own single is the normal. Private plane comes out. Par Paralysis, ACC, Robert's single. They're all very close together. Um, they're quite often thought of as as a kind of holy trinity of mm -hmm. electronic singles. Is, is that something that's been kind of imposed as a, as a retrospective impact or, or did you feel that at the time? Was there, was there a real kind of feeling that this was the, the well, next? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, most of the people who were making singles around, electronic singles around that time, were working in, in, a, in, a, in a silo. They didn't, there wasn't like a community, there wasn't a scene really. Yeah. I mean, I know cabs had connections with Throbbing Bristol, of course, and I'm sh in Sheffield with uh, you know Human League. I don't know what, quite what that relationship was, but for me, for me, that I didn't know anybody who was making that kind of music at all. Um, and I'm, I, I think Robert and Thomas were unique in you know from where they came from. They, I don't think they were connected to a scene. There was no, there wasn't a scene. No. There wasn't any music. <laughs> uh, there wasn't very much music. So, um, but as, as I said before, it was a very special moment in time. In, Kind of musical history with those, all that stuff coming together, all influenced by the same music, by what was coming out of Germany in the earlier part of the seventies. Yeah. The kind of affordability of recording and electronic instruments, and punk, and the, the DIY spirit that came out of punk. Came out of punk. It's weird with punk, isn't it? Really, because like one half of it was like very DIY, and the other half was like screw the majors for as much money as you can. Yeah. <laughs> but um, um, but it, it opened a lot. Doors like venues and so on that yeah, would yeah. never have had without exactly. you know, and, uh, I always credit the Desperate Bicycles mm. for doing their little how, how to make a record. They had a little pamphlet called How to Make a Record or something yeah. like that, or yeah. How to Release Your Own Record. And um, yeah, so it was it, it was all it was in the it was in the cosmos really. All those things kind of came together at once, but it came together from an, just an unconnected place. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at that time, you were working in the film industry. It's a bit posh. Yeah, <laughs> within the film industry. But um, no, I just wondered, um, and it was something I didn't know about before I started the sort of research into this. Yeah. Um, but that Robert uh, had also had some links with, um, well, particularly with the um, London Film 
um, filmmakers co op where, where he actually met, but yeah. he was already linked up with a chap called Nick. Yeah, a chap called Nick Emery. Oh, yeah, sounds familiar. Um, who I, I made the full power of thinking he was Dick Emery's son because <laughs> Dick Emery does have a son called Nick. Okay. <laughs> so once we got over that part of the older memory for the older members of the audience. But we, we actually have a, on the monitor that we've got a couple of the art films that um, Robert and, and Nick made. Robert was primarily doing the sound again. Right. And I think they borrowed a, a synth the um, AKS synth the A from I, I college. Must, I must have known that, but I've. I wondered if he'd talk to you about, about the film no, or so. Well, we did talk about film in general, I yeah. think, because we had a similar taste. But no, yeah. Yeah. He, he taped a lot of stuff off, off the television as well. That appears right. quite a lot in his... Yeah, found some. His, yeah. yeah. So James mm. Burke seems to appear. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow's World. Yeah. Um, yeah, we need to look at that. Um, yeah, I was just wondering... Um, you know, Robert didn't record for many years and his work is, although we've managed to release some more in the last couple of years, largely mm -hmm. part of the, the kind of burgeoning interest in, in his career, um, would he have been more prolific, do you think, if he'd been part of a band or a duo? It's hard to say. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, 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 um, this is a few years later, I guess in 86 or 87 maybe? No, 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 I was not. 83, 84, we moved offices and we had a studio in our new office in Harrow Road. Mm -hmm. And I got Robert along to, to just to do, I said, come on Robert, just go in there. There's a really, we had a really good engineer there called Paul Kendall, who did a lot of stuff, PK. And I thought they would really get on because they had a very similar kind of aesthetic and, uh, and approach, you know, a very unconventional approach. And yeah, so he yeah, so I said, come on, go, go in the studio for a while and just see what happens. But he was, you know, I think he was very, he was very self-critical, mm. and um, was not really happy with what he did there, and didn't even really want to play it to me, because I think he was worried that if I liked it, <laughs> I might want to do something with it. But, yeah. um, and that was that was that was sad because uh, I was really hoping that something might come out of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's amazing from um, unearthing some stuff from that that Hillary had some of the tapes that mm -hmm. had um, that's actually become a, an LP now. There's uh, different voices for you, yeah. um, and these were the demos that I think he'd done before Double Heart. That he okay. he kind of wanted to get that sound at, at Blackwing, but he couldn't reproduce that sound yeah. in, in commercial studio. Yeah, sure. So, but um, fabulous uh, homemade. Mm demos but yeah it's just uh, it's just how it is really isn't it um, I suppose finally um, and we kind of touched on the working practices at the time from from the 2020 perspective it seemed like an incredibly laborious process that you had to even just get in touch with people you know we've got copies of letters over there that yeah. were written from people to, yeah. you know, we found your address on the back of the single and I'm sending you mm. my tape and would you like to meet up and, you know, we've got OMD using a phone box as their office, mm. you know, <laughs> up in there. <laughs> yeah. like, did it seem as laborious as it feels now uh, or was it just that's the way we had to Not work? Sure. No, yeah, it was yeah. just the way we did it. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I mean, okay, communication was one thing, but the way we recorded and the limitations that we had, looking back, were actually really productive. And I, you know, I th you know now with digital technology, you can have 150, 200 tracks, and you just, it's just pointless, really. Yeah. And um, I encourage people to use less equipment. Yeah. And, to, 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 you know, I'm always, you know, not always. I'm sometimes just saying, take that out, take that out, it's too much, you know, you've lost the essence, you know. You do a demo, it sounds great, you go in the studio and you want to make a better version of it, and sometimes it becomes much worse, you lose the essence of yes. what it was that was exciting in the first place. Yeah. Um, actually, I just got my four-track recorder back, it, it went missing for about 30 years, <laughs> and then it was found in the, in the Nick Cash, who's the drummer of Fad Gadget, was uh, found in his attic. <laughs> He gave it back to me, I got it fixed, I just got it back recently and I really want to start recording on it again because it was really, uh, 
having that limited, I call it a limitation, it's a liberation. Yeah, you know. yeah. I think that's the case for the lot of Thompson Rocks, that they were working with Casios and originally yeah, on the first yeah. singles and yeah. you know it was, it was whatever you could lay your hands on really. Um, yeah, I mean it was, yeah, and you know making sounds like treating guitars to not sound anything like a guitar. Um, yeah, it was, you know, you had to be pretty resourceful, yeah. both in terms of getting equipment and then resourceful in how you used it. And, you know. and I think that has that impact in the sound and why yeah. it sounds so different from yeah. something recorded on a, mm. you know, in, in the studio with all the equipment. Yeah. Anyway, Daniel, thank you very much for your time and, pleasure. and your perspectives. Yeah. So, thank you. Very If you'd like, uh, we could take some questions from the floor. Um, Simon Helm from hi. Cold War Nightlife. Yeah, just, uh, hi, Dan. Just a, just a, a hard question, maybe, or, or maybe easy. Uh, did Robert ever share with you the words of the songs on the West Renton Pavilion recording? So, so when, you, when you were working together, did he share the words? I don't think he shared them with himself. Okay. <laughs> as far as I remember, they were completely improvised. Okay. Uh, every night, a different, you know. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay. I mean, the, yeah, the whole set was different. We had a back, very simple backing tape, but everything that went over the top of it was completely different. Every night. Okay. But uh, that's my memory. Yeah. You know, it was a long time ago. Thank I'm you. Completely wrong. Well, Nick, uh, talk about the backing tape. I know this is over there, yeah? Yes. Wouldn't that be cool to release that? The what? The backing tape? The backing tape we have. You've got the backing tape? Yes, we've got copies of the backing tape. <laughs> <laughs> we've got um, <laughs> we've got the real to real, which would probably need to be baked, but we've actually got one on, on cassette, which was from the Jeebus. Wow. It was about forty minutes, so it's actually yeah, long, yeah. longer than the, mm. the West Rampton because it's the, you were you were headlining and Oh yeah, we had one. <laughs> um, uh, well, sorry, sorry, I was just like completely blown away by what you. Sorry, well, will it be worth releasing the backing tape? Yeah, I think it'd be cool to hear that studio recorded backing of the. Well, it was recorded in my got, bed. The, back, the, the, the backing tape was recorded got, in my bedroom. You've got half an LP to work. You've got half an LP to work. Yeah, well, I, just, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll uh, get the recordings to you, Dad. Yeah, yeah. You it was, uh, yeah. It was funny actually. Just one little anecdote um, from. On that little tour with, I don't know, it was Stiff Little Fingers tour, we played Eric's in Liverpool, which is a legendary yeah. club. And that after every gig, we, we rewound the tape. But the night before that, Eric's gig, we'd forgotten to rewind it. <laughs> and we, obviously, we didn't get a sound check. So we yeah. just pressed play, and the whole thing was backwards, we just improvised on the, <laughs> 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 the tape. Uh, Did uh, anyone know? <laughs> no. I think, <laughs> Probably no one had heard you before, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Um, with the reissue of um, reissued the Bridget's coming out, um, what did you do in the remastering to make it different, or what did you hold back on to make it, you know, the, the, the you know, what, what, you know, well, final take? I, I, I wasn't actually involved in the mastering, mm. so you could ask Mr. Taylor back there, if he can remember, who's <laughs> <laughs> one of our new, new team. Um, but we wouldn't have wanted to clean it up too much, you know, because. I think it was just maybe getting it to a certain volume, really, more than actually trying to tweak the sound. I wouldn't want that to, you know, that to have been the case. So it sounded good on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I mean, in terms of making it sound good on Spotify, what what, what do you have to do? Or, you have you know, to compress the fuck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you know, we sometimes do different versions for Spotify and for vinyl or CD, so, yeah. I guess I was fascinated by the fact that 78, 79, I mean, obviously, you know, since coming down in price and um, you know, the proliferation of, like, potential proliferation of electronic mm -hmm. music, but all that stuff, and, and you clearly put all the brunt of that. Mm -hmm. And so it was still very, I mean, people, you know, Really wouldn't understand these days of like you know the horror of using electronics in music that still exists at that age. You know that almost mm. luddite 
phobia. And so it's almost like to actually embrace that kind of technology the way that you did almost makes you kind of quite a rare, almost perverse soul. I just wonder what originally, you know, when you say, you know, you and Robert, you know, very mm. different backgrounds. So you know, what actually originally um, kind of what sort of epiphany got you into into the idea of making electronic music? Was it even made even before Crowd Rock and all that? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think you know, listening to people like Kraftwerk in the very early days or Klaus Schulze in the very early days, um, Can, obviously, and Noi a bit later. Um, that was all going on at the same time as Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Um, I can't remember, all those kind of progressive rock bands. And, it, and I, was, I was not a fan of that progressive rock. I th partly because I thought they got all this amazing synthesizer and they're just trying to copy other instruments. Yeah. Same as it's a bit it's a bit sacrilegious to say this, but I felt the same about Switched on Bark, which was one of the first Walter Carlos, yeah. which was well, Wendy Carlos, or Walter Carlos, which I which is one of the first electronic records I heard, yeah. um, which I heard around the same time as Tonto's expanding headband. To, to, Thomas uh, um, he, he cites he yeah, yeah. To, um, as one of the first that he heard. Of yeah, that. well, it was one of the first to kind of pop, but you know. I wasn't, and I, you know, anyway, so I was against synthesizers being used in a certain way uh, as well, you know, and it was very, it was kind of, kind of pseudo classical, pompous, all about, you know, technique, all about technique. And but then I heard, you know, Can, and, and who you weren't an electronic band, but used electronics a lot, of course. Hawkwind as well, mm -hmm. who I yes. was a big fan of Hawkwind. Uh, it just, it was like using them as noise machines or, you know, or not, not noise, pure noise, but using them in a, in a totally unconventional way and that's really what attracted me to it. Yeah. But you remind, or you've reminded me of the, I think the Musicians Union at that time were trying to, mm. to, oh, yeah. to get yeah. synthesizers banned. Yeah, they were, yeah. 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 And there's a famous but you couldn't club. be a member yeah. of the union. And there's like, you know, there's a, thing, you know some, a lot of the punks were against synthesizers, so there's a famous quote, there's a famous documentary with Joe Strummer going on about Moog synthesizers with his fake Cockney accent. And, um, <laughs> and, you know, the undertones, my cousin Kevin, and all those kind of things. They were kind of anti, it was a bit too arty, a bit too art school. Yeah. But having said that, a lot of people who did make that kind of music had gone to art school, <laughs> including me. <laughs> and, um, yeah. yeah. I hope that answers your question roughly. <laughs> Else? Okay, well, again, thank you, Good. Daniel. Thank you, you very appreciate much. it. <laughs> um, we're we're going to finish off the kind of organised part this evening with a, a short interview that Tom, Thomas recorded with his brother. Uh, just about a month ago and he's sent down to be part of the exhibition. Unfortunately Thomas doesn't keep particularly well um, and he felt it, was, it would be compromising on his health to come down to London at this point in the Covid um, pandemic. So, um, so this is his contribution along with this, the soundtrack that you heard earlier on. So thank you. Thanks very much.